Welcome everybody. This is Moxie's Insight Session, which we have every Wednesday at 2 p.m. We've changed our weekly offerings a little bit. We were just trying some things out. We were trying to do a session on Tuesday and Wednesday, and that was just too much for our team. We have a really small team. We're a startup. And so really it's just me and Jessica who were doing the presentations, even though we have Linda, and we have another woman named Desi, who is our research director. And then we have a marketing person named Alex. And we're, um, we all work together really well. But just for this particular presentation, usually it's just Jessica and me. So a little bit about an insight session. So they're called insight sessions because we used to call ourselves the Academic Insight Lab. And it was AI Lab for short. Uh, but we decided to rebrand and we changed our name to Moxie. But we still like this idea of an insight session, coming together and sharing insight. Typically what we do is I'll talk a little bit, share some information. Usually I do a demo and then time for Q&A. Kind of going to pepper that Q&A throughout the presentation today just to give you uh, more chances to weigh in and to kind of get some more interaction going. So if you have a question as I'm talking, feel free to put it in the chat or jot it down for later because I'm going to stop, like I said, periodically and give you a chance to weigh in. But first of all, an announcement, and you should have gotten an email about this. We are updating all the tools this weekend. So basically, there the prompts will be optimized. We are changing some things, but we're not changing the core offerings. So everything that you, all the tasks and the functions that we offer will still be there, but behind the scenes, we're optimizing some things. So it really probably will not, you, you might not notice a big difference, but what it does mean is that you'll need to save any output that you have in the tools. Like when the, when the tool gives you feedback, if you're not copying and pasting that or otherwise somehow saving it outside the browser in the Moxie browser, if you need it, you will want to save it before midnight Eastern this Friday because we are optimizing them and they will be completely new tools and your old outputs will be gone by Saturday. So let me just pause right there and just see if anybody has questions about that, because I know this is your work and I know that's really important to you, your research and getting that feedback. So does anybody have a question about that? I'll show you what the new kind of configuration of tools will look like to give you a heads up in just a minute, but I just want to make sure you understand what I'm talking about there. You have the chats on the left-hand side, the threads, anything that's in there you will want to save. What questions do you have about that, anybody? Okay, and you should get a couple more emails about that just to make sure that you don't forget. So basically, the new toolkits will be organized like this. This is what you will see. They're basically divided into the sections of a research article or of a dissertation. So there's an introduction, a whole section on introductions. Anything that you might write that's inside an introduction, it will be there. So your purpose statement, your research questions, any hypotheses that you have. If you are in a CPED program, maybe your problem state. So um, that is, that's what will happen in the introduction. When you click on it, you will immediately be prompted, what are you writing? And there will be two workflows there. One will be dissertation or thesis, and the other one will be like academic manuscript for publication. So whichever one you're writing, you'll have a place to go. And then from there, you'll see a breakdown of all the possible tasks that you might want to accomplish inside an introduction, some of which you may be familiar with already and, and some not. But basically, if we associate it with the introduction, it will be there. Now, as you probably know, there's some overlap between introductions and lit reviews, especially in the area of manuscript writing, because a manuscript is much shorter than a dissertation. So there may be some of that, and you may see some duplicated processes, but it doesn't really matter as long as you get what you want. We also will have a literature review section, a section for materials and methods. And again, all of these tools will have two workflows, one for dissertations and theses and the other for manuscript writing. And then results, discussion, and conclusion, we've kind of lumped that together. And getting published in academic job market. So this one is a little bit different because we'll have the workflows are not 
dissertation and manuscript writing. They are one for aspects of publication that are sort of unrelated to the manuscript. Well, I guess they are related to the manuscript, but more like the logistical kind of housekeeping details, like writing a submission letter to the journal, choosing a journal, and then getting a full manuscript review, getting or simulating peer feedback, or taking peer feedback that you have gotten returned to you from a peer reviewer and processing it and making a plan of action. So that tool is now in this kind of hot pink colored toolkit. And then the other workflow here is academic job market preparation materials. So basically this tool asks you, what job are you applying for? And you give it the job description. It processes that job description. It outputs a checklist of job documents that you might want to write or need to write to apply for that job. And then it coaches you through the process of writing each of those. So for example, a CV, a cover letter, a research statement, a teaching statement, maybe an inclusion statement, like a DI kind of statement. It'll give you best practices or it'll give you feedback on any of those job documents. So those are the two workflows there. And then finally, these premium AI models, this is where you can get access to GPT-4, Claude 3, Perplexity, and Gemini Pro. So that's kind of a, the new way that you'll see this when you log in on Saturday. It will look a little bit different. And like I said, your old outputs will not be there. So you need to save them. Just going to pause again, see if you have any questions. Yes. Someone wrote in the chat, uh, I always copy paste everything important and save it. This is a really good idea because sometimes we don't, sometimes our, the, the platform that we build the tools on, which is called Mind Studio, sometimes they do updates. And when they do updates, occasionally it will clear your chat, but usually everything that you have is saved in your browser. And so you're, you're in control of it. There've been a couple of times when we have it really been able to explain why somebody has lost their data. And of course, we don't, we weren't there when they lost it. We don't know what actually happened. We try to help you, but there's real, there's not much we can do because we don't have access to any of your private chats. So there's not much we can do. I think this is a really good idea to just save as you go, just like any other workflow. Okay. Well, if you think of something, you know, you can always put it in the chat and I can come back to it. If you have a question, so I have downloaded these slides and I'm going to put them here in the, in the chat for you. Let me go and get this so you can click on them or follow along if you want to. If you see that little turquoise paper clip, this is a hike for you. And so, for example, this hyperlink goes to a form where you can suggest topics for these interactive interactive sessions. We also have, so today's session is kind of AI literacy session, but last week we had more of a group coaching kind of writing session. So we're thinking of trying out some like writing retreats and doing some more unique things. Regardless, you can suggest or pose a question for us using this form. So I just wanted to let you know that. And the way that I have this presentation organized, and now I'm just going to jump right into the content here, is uh, according to our AI literacies framework, then we have a white paper uh, coming out on this very soon. And then we're going to take that white paper and expand it to become a theoretical paper that explains these three aspects of what we believe represents robust AI literacy, which is functional. So just basically understanding how AI works. And when I say AI, I'm talking about generative AI. And then critical is the next circle. So using our critical thinking skills to evaluate and assess the outputs so that we can recognize bias. And then rhetorical AI literacy includes patterning, finding, and analyzing tone, style, voice within the content, and knowing which models are better at certain tasks and certain outputs. So we believe that they build on each other. We believe you have to start with functional, build into critical, and build into rhetorical. And if you come every week, you should by now have a really solid idea of functional literacy for sure. So something that I don't talk about a lot with regard to functional literacy is kind of what makes up an LLM under the hood, so to speak. Like if you were thinking in terms of a car analogy, this would be like, well, how does the engine work? 
So you know that an LLM has lots of data. It's basically a big database. And then the way that that data is processed is called its architecture. And so the difference in something like GPT, which by the way, stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, that transformer architecture is a type of deep learning that really changed how humans could interact with computers. And it wasn't like any of the other models that came out, which just basically uh, created one word after another, after another. The transformer architecture allowed the model to look at an entire sentence all at once using something called self-attention. And so this is what determined the parts of the sentence that were most relevant to each other so that the model could understand context and meaning a lot more effectively and in a lot more of a, a bigger context. So that architecture has two parts, and I won't get into this, but an encoder and a decoder. And you can look it up if you're interested in this to find out more about transformers. There's some really cool YouTube videos that kind of walk you through the process behind the scenes, but that's basically how they work. And then after that all happens, humans have to sort of label these data sets in terms of images and text. They are behind the scenes, and this is called human reinforcement learning, labeling images for object recognition and facial recognition, for example, but also uh, labeling text for certain communicative functions or other things. And there's a lot of concern about this about how much those human reinforcement learning uh, employees were paid because they were typically in uh, under-resourced countries. And it's a really interesting and concerning topic. I encourage you to go and read about that. Not the focus of today, but uh, yeah, it's for sure an issue, just like environmental concerns are an issue. So beyond that, LLMs then use that context of whatever's in the model to determine the next word. So they can look at, it's a rainy day, or that should say, it's a sunny day, the color of the sky is blue, or it's a rainy day, the color of the sky is gray. And so just like we can look around and notice context, they look at the context of what they're given in that language model in terms of the vocabulary to determine what that next word is going to be. Now, what are they using to do that? Well, they're using websites, Wikipedia, books, articles, databases, social media posts, and on and on and on. Petabytes, P-E-T-A, I'd never even heard of that word. Peta of data, so big we can't comprehend. And this is just a short, you know, a short list of what's included there. But I, I know if you've been here before, you've seen me and heard me talk about this a lot. So what happens if that data isn't clean? If you came to, and, and what do I mean by clean? If you came to our critical literacies webinar a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this, this uh, article about the Chinese token training data in GPT-4 Omni, their new model that's free to everybody. I talked about how it is polluted with pornography and gambling and lottery sites. And that information came from an article I read from the MIT Press. So about a week later, a few days later, the MIT Press published a follow-up article that explains about this kind of what they're calling a blunder, OpenAI's blunder, and why it happened. It's because the, the web data from China in the in Chinese language is not like web data in, in the English language or in other languages because of the governmental regulations that the Chinese government has. And so this is a concern for this free model. One reason they're able to make such a fast and seemingly amazing model free is because they've cut some corners along the way. Now, we haven't seen how that plays out. Well, I have an idea about how that plays out that I hope I'll have time to get to today in terms of especially image. I think it's easier to see with image generation. I think it's happening in the text generation too, but I think the bias is stronger in GPT-4 Omni, which is problematic because it's free. And so that means very wide access. People are using it all over the place. They're generating all kinds of things. And so if it's an empirical question, is it more biased? I don't know. We would have to like do a study and find out. But from my perspective, and I'll show you the anecdotal evidence I have so far, I do think it's not as clean as the premium model before that's the premium model that people pay for. So anyway, again, these are linked so you can read more about it. So let me just stop there and just 
check in with you. Those are functional AI literacy topics. How does a model work? How does it generate data? What questions do you have about that? Do you have any underlying like concerns, comments? Has anything I've said been like unclear or are there other issues? I have a question that's related. I think what you're saying is clear. I was just curious because Claude is supposed to be the the like the nice mm -hmm. AI, you know, the, uh, it, is that <clears throat> due to yeah. tr the training data being better cleaned? Yes. Okay. So Claude, Claude is by the company Anthropic. And if you read about the history of the company, basically those uh, founders were at OpenAI and they had concerns about the data cleaning and the human reinforcement learning and training and all of that. And they left. They left right before the launch of GPT-3 in, uh, I think, late summer of 2022, right before the launch happened. And so that's a very interesting and dramatic story. But yeah, Claude is known as the helpful, harmless AI. And uh, it tends to be just generally more more polite. You can you can tell that Claude is like making an effort. It almost seems like Claude's like making an effort to be nice in a way that GPT four or three point five or four oh isn't. It seems more neutral to me. GPT Claude definitely seems like it's making an effort. Another way to say it, but that's kind of the personality that they want. So yeah, that's exactly why because they take a lot of time to clean and ensure that that data is really safe, helpful, and harmless. What other questions? Anything coming to mind? Yeah, if you haven't tried Claude, Claude 3 is also really good. Uh, I use it uh, almost exclusively to help me write emails. So I will just type notes into Claude. Here's what I want to say in this email. And it won't even be complete sentences. And Claude will kind of output the uh, sentences for me. Now, you will see some weirdness in Claude, of course, because it's not a human, but for me, it's more natural. Okay, well, let's go ahead and move on now to do and talk about a little bit of critical literacy. So this is, and my link symbol is not turquoise here, it's, it's blue, but this is also a hyperlink to an open access article about critical AI literacy metaphors. And so Mahabali is one of my favorite critical pedagogy scholars. She's at the American University in Cairo, and she and some other researchers who you can connect with on LinkedIn recently wrote this article. And when I first saw this, I thought, oh my goodness, what is this name? Assistant, parrot, or colonizing loudspeaker chat GPT metaphors for developing critical AI literacy. Basically, this article argues that when we teach AI literacy, we can teach it through metaphors. And these are some of the metaphors from the article. So for functional AI literacy, and actually I developed this, I should say this, I read this several months ago. And that's when I had the idea to create the visual representation of the AI literacies framework, which they borrowed from Silber and then we adapted from Silber. So I really should be crediting this Gupta et al. article on top of Silber because I got the ideas from the both of them. But basically, they take these when they teach, they say we can help students, and I think their audience is mostly undergraduates, understand functional AI literacy by teaching them to think about an A as a helper or as a calculator for words or as an autocomplete or as a tool or an assistant. Things that we already are comfortable with generally. This is basically how AI functions. So functional literacy metaphors. But the ones I want to focus on today here are in the middle for these critical AI literacy metaphors. So how can we think about AI through a critical lens, the output? Well, the first one I love, of course, most of us here are women. So we are very familiar with this idea of mansplaining. I have a 19-year-old son and he had never heard this term. And I said it the other day and he was like, what did you say? What was that word you said? I said, mansplaining. It's when a man explains something that usually that you, you know already and there's no thought to like, oh, are you familiar with this concept? It, they sometimes just launch. So of course, not all men do this. This is very stereotypical. I'm just, I'm just telling you what's in the article and helping you understand what it means. So if you think about 
what is in that data in a language model? It is written by all kinds of people, right? But it's very westernized, meaning most of it is written in English. Most of it is written by weird people from weird cultures, weird meaning Western, educated, rich, industrialized, etc. Those things we talked about in that critical literacies webinar. And so I think this is probably Maha Bali's contribution. Like I didn't know this word, but this is according to the article, an Arabic word for kind of like a BS, a person who BSs. I don't speak Arabic, so I'm not, I can't be sure, but that's how it was explained. A stochastic parrot. So there was a really popular article called uh, Stochastic Parrots that was written in 2021, warning that AIs can be biased. But stochastic means, uh, and I didn't know this, I had to look it up. So if, you, if you're not familiar with this word, don't, you're, you're, you're not uh, abnormal. I think this is a very, very unique word. It's a process that means a random or, or like a, a system that behaves in a way that is non-deterministic. So it's inherently random. It cannot be predicted precisely. And that's why AI, we say, is lowercase weird. So sometimes we can't really know why it does the things that it does. We can't explain the output. So it's weird capitals, capital weird, the acronym. And it's also weird meaning like odd. A blurry JPEG of the web is a way that a New York Times columnist wrote about it very early on. And then this is one that they added a colonizing loudspeaker. So it's a loudspeaker, but it's speaking from the perspective of a colonizer, like adapt to these forms. So this is a critical lens, whether or not you agree with these or not. I think it's really helpful to understand what we mean when we say critical AI literacy. And then they have some for rhetoricals too. We'll save that for another day, but I just thought we would talk through these critical kinds of metaphors. What do you think about these? How does that align with what you already know about AI? Does any of it resonate with you? What are your thoughts on that? Hi, Kimberly. I think just overall talking about this gives AI really that more uh, humanistic feel, right? Talking about a lens that this system is going to look through, right? And that's what we do as researchers with our theory, right? This is more human. So that's what I, that's my takeaway. Yep. I mean, the reason it's biased is because humans are biased and it's been trained on our language. So it's not, you know, generating bias from nowhere, but it's also not neutralized. Now, there have been some efforts to neutralize it. That's kind of the new thing that I'm hearing about. I'm hearing about these companies trying to neutralize the rhetoric in such a way so that it doesn't sound anti-Trump or pro-Trump, for example, or one, you know, in, in the American context, like very Democratic or very Republican. It's supposed to be neutral. But to me, that's just as biased. If you're trying to neutralize it, then you're you're still just, you know, placing a, a, a heavy human hand on it. So I don't know what yeah. the answer is. Yeah. I mean, good luck with that. I mean, we yeah. can't even do that. <laughs> right. 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 Hey, what's happening? How you doing? I was, I was hanging out in the wrong session again, me and these links. You know, yeah, but uh, we got, we finally got it figured out. But right. oh, it's not your fault. Uh, I'm the one to put it in the team's meeting <laughs> on, my, oh, on my own you, Outlook. Okay. I put the wrong one in Outlook. But question for you. Uh, can you go back to that one slide that you just were showing? Go back one slide. Can you give up? How do they? I mean, I'm just trying to think of where I've seen examples, like maybe where I've asked the AI to do something and it came across maybe in one of these types of that type of response. Because if you can't, I don't know, I say if you can't spot it or you can't identify it, then how can you change it? And so I'm just trying to, that's kind of where my head is spinning around because, uh, you know, like when your computer does that little thing where it just spins in the middle. Yeah, that's kind of mm -hmm. where my brain was as I was looking at these and, and thinking, you know, I'm using this tool and have I been coming across as to that Falawi so, when that's the one that bugs me. <laughs> right, I know. Well, Just you, numbers. you, so a, a little bit of a more neutral way to say that is like, it's confident. It sounds good and it yeah. sounds confident. And by good, yes. I mean, like, it sounds like you're an educated person. You know, it's right. the, the grammar is always going to be pretty much right. Although the grammar and the spelling GPT 3.5, I was accidentally using it the other day. I didn't know I was using it, but I had switched. I had toggled it 
to uh -huh. 3.5 and it output a misspelled word. And I was like, hmm. whoa, how did that happen? I mean, again, it's trained on human data and mm -hmm. somehow mm -hmm. in the human reinforcement learning, it didn't get cleaned out or whatever. It's not a big deal. But yeah, I think the this idea that it's very confidently wrong sometimes, confidently yeah. wrong is maybe a better way to say it. And I don't think it would be uh, noticeable just outside of a very specific context. Okay. So once you get it in context, you can start to really see. And I have some pictures. It's harder with language because, again, the context is a little less clear. But in a, with a picture, which I'm going to show in just a minute, actually, maybe that's a good segue. With a picture, I think, you know, as we have this, you know, this phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. So let, let's look at that. Let me actually, I'm going to skip over some of these slides. I was going to talk about uh, rhetorical literacy a little bit, and I was going to talk about this penguin prompting. But just for the sake of time, let me say there are lots of prompting frameworks that you can learn and apply when you're interacting with AI. And this would be a part of rhetorical AI literacy. There's a lot of examples in these slides, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a future session and talk about this idea of what needs to be in a good prompt. But for the sake of time, let me go ahead and skip forward and say last or it wasn't last week, it was a couple of weeks ago when we did the critical AI literacy, I, I shared this picture from a friend of mine who works in a writing center at a, in a graduate college. And so she was trying to generate some images for a presentation she was doing. And so what you see here in these slides, and I'm just showing you this to remind you if you don't remember, or if you weren't there for that webinar, you can watch that webinar, by the way, on YouTube. But she was prompting directly to, to Dolly3, and you can see her prompts here, seeing the two graduate students talking, sharing a laptop computer in the style of Da Vinci, sitting in a cubicle, dominant colors, red and gold, because the school's dominant colors are red and gold, the university colors. And so this was the first image she got, right? So in the webinar, I said immediately what I thought was, to me, this looks like Jesus and Mary right? This is my cultural paradigm. That's what I thought. And so then she said, I like this one, but can you revise it? So the student on the right, which is this guy, is dressed in a 21st century Western style. And so Dolly 3 somehow interpreted that as like country and Western or like the Wild West, right? And so it generated an image, a very stereotypical image of a Native American man. And then she said, okay, let's have the Native American man be dressed in jeans because now she's getting more specific, right? Really what I wanted when I said Western is I just meant like jeans and a t-shirt, no headdress, give him a modern short haircut. Both other figures should have curious engaged expressions on their faces. And so we get a little bit better. So Damon, you were asking like, well, what if I'm coming across? Well, let's go back for just a minute before I show you the penultimate problem with this. Here we have the man and the woman and they're both kind of sharing and talking together. In this image, she's passive. He's explaining. And in the webinar, I think I jokingly said, we might argue that he's mansplaining. Same thing here. She's passive. He's the explainer. So clearly he's the tutor, right? And she's the student. So if we read into this, if we critically sort of elaborate on what we're seeing here, we could say maybe this is like a mansplaining situation. We don't really know. And then finally, even though she said no headdress, no feather headdress, still the model was not able to solve that problem. It just generated him with the headdress, no matter what. So it was problematic. She obviously did not use this. So um, what I said in the webinar was you need to mitigate this with iterative prompting, but she had been iterating. She had done that. So, uh, you know, I said, okay, you've got to call out errors. You've got to emphasize when the, when the model doesn't listen to you, you have to correct it. Essentially, you have to say, you ignored my directive to do X. You have to break it down into steps. First this, then this, then this, not that. And so you need to play around with it in a, in a, a little, well, it's not going to be fast. So AI has this reputation for being speedy, right? Efficient. It gets your productivity up. But sometimes, it, you know, if we want to be careful, it's not going to be fast. So what I did, did is- Did it also that. say that the student was the, the lady was the teacher, the student was the one on the right? No, it didn't. She didn't give it any that of that context. Because I thought on that one 
I think it was the one when he's in the headdress. Go down one more. He's in the headdress every time. Yeah, so Except, yeah go back, go down one. Go down there's, one more. That's the oh, first sorry. one. Right there with the student on the right is dressed in the 21st. So I was this thinking is, like, he's supposed to be the student. He looks like, like you said. They're he, both. Okay, so they're both supposed to be students. And oh, I, in the context yeah. of this particular there it's a graduate student mentoring program so right. one of the graduate students is the mentor and the other is the student or so the receiving end of it it's like a more advanced graduate student with a novice and i guess so, it just assumed <clears throat> that the guy was the 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 the, uh, the mansplaining thing assumed that he was the it seems like it that's it what seems like looking it. at from the images i mean to make him look like jesus i mean I'm okay i'm yeah. gonna go on you now <laughs> this is crazy yeah <laughs> it's pretty crazy so I decided I would pick this apart a little bit. And I took this penguin prompting, which I, I didn't talk about too much today. But basically, penguin prompting is you need to have a persona, a context, a task, a format, an example, and a tone. And I analyzed her original prompt. She didn't have a persona. She did have a context, sharing a laptop. I'm talking about my friend who originally wrote this prompt. She did have a task. She had no format, no example. But the tone, and this is hard with, with images, I'm calling this the tone. I guess we could maybe call this format or an example. I don't think it matters what we call it anyway. She didn't have all of those, but in the style of Da Vinci and Red and Gold. And so I thought, well, okay, what if I elaborate on that and I give it a little more context? What if I say, act as an illustrator for a graduate college handbook? generate an image with a scene of two graduate students talking, sharing a laptop computer in the style of Da Vinci. They're sitting in a cubicle together. The dominant colors are red and gold. So I gave it more. I followed that penguin prompting framework to the T, right? And this is what it output. So two white guys. And so then I said, okay, let's go back. Can you diversify the graduate students a bit? And I even got a little snarky. Certainly, you don't think that white men represent grad student, okay? So I'm calling out, let's go back, let's do this again. And now it generates this image, which for me, it's better, right? It's not two white men. There's a woman now, and we have some color. But the, the style of her dress, immediately I thought, oh my goodness, she looks like it's depicting a slave. So I don't know, you know, I'm starting to read into this to the point where it's like, am I just being overly critical? And I said, wow, that's a little disconcerting. Now she looks like a slave. Can you modernize the depiction? And so it came up with this. That's a little bit better. Yeah. And then I said, who's the tutor in this image? To me, this looks like, you know, I wanted to know who's the tutor in this image. Is it always the man? Please try to be a little more sensitive to diversity, equity, inclusive representations. And now it generates this very strange image of the man touching the woman. And it told me in the output, like, this is a Hispanic man and an African-American woman, and they are working together to solve a problem. So I don't know. At this point, I think I'm just like it having looks like fun she's, with the weirdness of it. It looks like he's giving a distress sign for like, please help me. <laughs> he's touching me. Why is <laughs> please he touching help. me? I'm being held against my will. Or really, I'm curious, how many tokens did it take to do these iterative? I, yeah. So as you know, this is a really good point generating images is is token heavy that means it it costs or the energy it takes to charge an iphone for each image that you generate so i have basically other than when i'm teaching and i'm using this as a way to demo kind of what's happening under the hood i have really stopped we have stopped generating images for our website or for our blogs or for stuff like that we just use um like stock photos but we can't really tell sometimes what's a stock photo that was AI generated versus an actual stock photo. So I think that there's some cloudiness there. But yeah, I was generating these. And at this point, I stopped, as you can see, I, I stopped because uh, I, it, it was getting weird. And but finally, I did get something that I thought was very good, very representative, and that I would actually use somewhere. But yes, Linda's right. The environmental cost of generating images in particular is very high. And I have more on that in other webinars. So as you know, GPT-4.0 is now free. So let me just show you kind of what happened when I use GPT-4.0 and why I'm concerned that it might have more bias. 
you'll certainly see that the quality of these images is less with the free model. So I took that same prompt, act as an illustrator for a graduate college handbook, generate an image, all the same things, right? And so again, we got this weird, it's Da Vinci. It's in the style of Da Vinci. So I sort of set it up for a bias because Da Vinci was writing in a different, or drawing and painting in a different time. But this is what it came up with. And then I iteratively prompted it. It got a little bit better, but still, you know, white men and then like, a white woman and a white man, he's modern, he's dressed more modern, she's not. And then there's all these onlookers, I don't know who they are. But I'm being specific, people from different genders, backgrounds, sizes, etc. And then we get this. And then I then I was like, okay, the people of color are backgrounded, and the white people are foregrounded. And finally, I got this. And I was, you know, I was pretty happy with this representation, but you can see, you know, the, there's just not as much depth to the images that it's been generating. But yeah, I mean, this is what happens. The other thing that someone was telling me about, and this is just an example of someone who was trying to get ChatGPT to generate a bio based on her resume or her CV. And she's a woman, she's Hispanic. She's curious what the AI would do without a name. So she just put her resume in without a name and it ended up imagining that she was a woman. So I thought, okay, that's interesting. Let me see what I can do. I took a resume and put it into ChatGBT and Claude. And I used the free one just to see, you know, if there would be any difference because four, I tried it with four, the premium model, and it, and it did the same thing. But I could not get the model to think of the resume coming from a man at all. I tried this on 3.5, 4, 4.0, 4 and Claude 3. And I tried Sonnet and Opus, Claude 3 Sonnet and Claude 3 Opus. I could not get it to generate um, any output that used male pronouns at all. Um, it was always a woman. So, yeah, that was interesting. So I'm going to stop. I've been talking a lot. What are your thoughts on this? Are we splitting hairs? Why does this matter? How does this matter? Does this matter? What are, just, what are your thoughts? Well, I would say that it matters because unless you're actually playing with it and seeing kind of like you've done in, in these examples, someone who isn't might take the first thing who is still very, very new to, uh, you know, to AI and or is not there mature wise yet, or, you know, in terms of their mm -hmm. graduate, their graduate. Degree. So I, I think, I feel like that's where they need to understand that you really have to play around and then sometimes just say, no, this is not acceptable. I'm going to, you have to think for yourself here. Yeah, I agree, Linda. That's exactly what I think when I use it. I don't like using any of the tools. I like to do my own writing. You know, I do my and get my own thoughts and then use it to help me refine as opposed to, and you can see where, I don't know, some people may use it too much as a crutch. I'm not sure if that's how I want to say it, but it shouldn't be a front line, in my opinion. You still need to have the knowledge and have your ideas and you know, build your own knowledge and use this tool. Like we use the internet when it was new and everybody was afraid of it, right? It's the same thing. So it's something I want to use down the road. And I think all of these examples to that, don't use this to formulate your ideas for you. Yeah, I think this is really, really relevant for like new undergraduates. I think they are like pri prime age. They are digital natives. They're all tech savvy for the most part. They show up at university and we give them lots of critical thinking training in terms of their writing and their evaluation of sources. And we teach them those sorts of critical thinking skills. And now I think this is just another area, exactly as Susan said, we, we've done it for the internet for years and years now. And we just... It's another digital literacy skill, essentially. I think it also points to the fact that we really have to be educated ourselves to be able to help our students. This is not something we can just kind of go through willy-nilly because I think that's where problems are going to 
And you're always going to get those students who are, um, you know, little electrons, the path of least resistance, right? So we have mm -hmm. to be put into that and, and help to support those students to say, hey, look, this is what you need to do and really kind of guide them in the right direction. It's, it's not going to be perfect. Yeah. Anybody else have comments or questions to share any anecdotes? Well, I do have, I did, can tell you since um, nobody else is um, chiming in that I did use some AI to uh, help me publish a uh, documentary view that I did. And, you know, I wrote the whole thing myself and I just helped, used it to help me kind of fine tune it and it pointed out a few things. But, you know, it really was more work because I had to go through it with a fine tooth comb and I deleted things out. But it, in the end, it was really quite helpful to me. Yeah, I think that I think that's the truth that it is if you do it well. It's just a tool and tools take time. The same as if you ran it through Grammarly and you, you know, carefully decided to accept or reject certain Grammarly suggestions. The same thing is going to happen if you put it into an AI and you ask for feedback. You won't yeah. accept it wholesale for sure. And I think if you're going to try to use it with something like that, I thought like, you know, if you did like a book chapter review or like I did a documentary review, it was kind of a nice little small project to mm -hmm. try it out with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you are putting in your work, the other thing to remember is that it's going to summarize. The longer the text you put in, it'll read it, but it's going to immediately condense it and summarize it to make it easier to go back through and contextualize. So anything that you put, and this is something I for a future, anything that you put first in the prompt or last in the prompt is going to stand out to as attention getting to the model. It's trained to follow that. So if there's something really important in the prompt, we always put it at the end or at the very beginning. In the middle, it's just like humans. In the middle of a presentation, you don't really remember as much as you remember from the beginning and the end. It's very similar. So uh, prompting things in the beginning and the end, if you are using an open model and not like one of our tools where we are doing most of the prompting for you, you're still prompting our tools. You're I mean, those rules still apply, but you're probably not doing as much prompting with, you know, a feedback tool from Moxie as you are with open chat GPT for a Claude. Everything so is recorded. It's all out on YouTube. We usually get it out by Friday. So um, if you go back to last week, you can see every other session we've ever done. Cool. Yes. Thank and they are indexed. So you can click on if there's some, you know, if you want to tune out some of it, you can, and you can see the index in the YouTube description. Thanks everybody for coming. It was really good to see you and hear you. So please do come back next week and feel free to share. Yeah. Have a great day. Bye everyone.